next speaker will be dr. riad salem who's a one of the leaders of interventional radiology at northwestern memorial hospital and university dr. salem is internationally known for his work particularly in the field of hepatic cellular carcinoma where he uses a yttrium this is something you guys should know yttrium it's a it's a chemical you know all right it's it's it emits radiation that's physical okay so anyway so dr. Salem I think really sits using using physical techniques at the edge between the physical and life science and therapeutic sciences so it's a pleasure to have you so thank you for the opportunity to present a little bit sort of what we're doing from an interventional radiology standpoint so I'm a radiologist I trained in radiology diagnostic radiology and subsequent to that I did a fellowship in interventional radiology which means I use image guided tools to either make diagnoses or biopsy patients or really sort of try to participate in the multi multidisciplinary management of patients with HCC and most of the patients that I deal with now are in fact HCC patients hepatocellular carcinoma primary liver cancer tends to occur in patients that have things that have developed cirrhosis either alcoholic cirrhosis or viral from viral hepatitis but really managing I just wanted to start off with saying that managing the HCC patient uh, requires really the classic multidisciplinary approach that you've heard out about before in general if a tumor in the liver is resectable you want to resect it that is a potential cure the problem is only about 10 to 15 percent of all HCC patients are resectable leaving 85 percent of all of them to receive palliative therapies either interventional radiology therapies radiotherapies oncologic therapies etc so only about 10 to 15 percent of the patients are here whereas now you have the remainder of the tools of of of, uh, of uh, teams that are involved in managing that patient and I sit right here from either diagnosing a patient uh, using MRI biopsying the tumor and then treating it with a variety of ways that I'd like to present to you uh, uh, today in terms of what we do a very important concept when you think about HCC and cancer is tumor stage early stage is not the same thing as late stage and you have to think about uh, different ways to stage and I, I would say that HCC is probably one of the more complex cancers to stage because there are two conditions that are happening when a patient has a hepatoma they have a tumor but along with the tumor they have an abnormal liver because they have cirrhosis so what's very difficult about treating those patients is that you have to be careful not only about causing adverse events while you treat the tumor but also adverse events that can be caused because the patient has an abnormal liver as an example many patients have small lesions that we cannot treat because they're already in liver failure so we can't give them drug they can't metabolize drug we can't give them other types of therapies and so understanding the various staging systems and this is one that is particularly used uh, frequently is called the BCLC the Barcelona classification that associates the stage of the disease from very early to more advanced and associates it with a standard of care treatment uh, that patients essentially try to or we try to associate patients with let's take a look at some simple things one of the early tools or one of the tools that we still use is called radiofrequency ablation simple tool you place a needle inside uh, a, a tumor and you ablate it so if you cannot resect it uh, you can place a probe such as this identify it with imaging guidance ultrasound CT MR you advance these probes that in this case heat the tumor but there are other probes as you can see here this is ultrasound so this is a live image of a liver with a live image of a uh, RFA probe exactly within the tumor and so what you have here is we are ablating this lesion with heat you can do it with cool you can do it by injecting absolute alcohol in this area you can do it by a variety of ways but the rationale is a targeted concept by using image guidance to essentially ablate the small area potentially curing this patient now there are other things that you can do when you do identify that lesion in that needle like I said alcohol ablation is one concept and the reason we think about either PEI percutaneous ethanol injection or RFA is simplicity and cost it's very cheap to place a needle and inject some absolute alcohol in the tumor and potentially kill it uh, it's a bit more expensive to use RFA although most of the literature suggests uh, that the long-term outcomes following RFA are slightly better than PEI but nobody's ever done sort of cost analyses to try to compare these two but certainly in developing countries 
alcohol ablation for small lesions is perfectly acceptable in terms of a cost-effective uh, tool to treat these patients. Now, what about when you cannot ablate these lesions, so larger lesions or things where uh, an ablation is a potentially higher risk? We use uh, techniques that I perform most commonly called embolic techniques, which means a catheter is placed. This is what I do. I place catheters inside these arteries. This is the hepatic artery that is perfusing what we call a hypervascular tumor. These tumors are hypervascular. They absorb uh, the blood flow, which means that if they have, they absorb the blood flow, then whatever I inject in this place as well, they will also absorb. So the concept is for me to get close to this lesion and inject a therapeutic. Uh, and one of the most common therapeutics to inject is chemotherapy. Uh, uh, doxorubicin, mitomycin uh, are things that we can use and also cisplatinum. And so when you think about the, a treatment, one treatment is called chemoembolization. So a catheter is placed in this area here, and I uh, get to this tumor and I inject high-dose chemotherapy. At our center, we use mitomycin, adromycin, and cisplatinum. Some people use single, uh, single drug. There's no rationale to use one, uh, two, or three. Uh, the concept is to try to put the three most potent, sort of uh, very potent agents in a very small and localized area to see if we can obliterate that tumor. This is called chemoembolization. And we have been practicing this for about 30 years, but it took until uh, 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 2002 when we were able to demonstrate a survival benefit of using chemoembolization to no treatment. So when there are no accepted standards, the clinical trial paradigm in general tends to be your therapy versus placebo or no treatment. Now with more and more available treatments, uh, this is becoming a bit more complex because patients usually resist uh, the, uh, the concept of no treatment arms, and many people don't really want to enroll in these. And so uh, we do have some difficulties, but this study was performed, and you can see that chemoembolization does impart a, a better overall survival compared to patients uh, with no treatment. Now, one of the areas you heard Dr. Lick talk about, one of the areas that we're focusing on are these small microscopic radioactive particles this is called radioembolization, where, as I showed you before, you place a catheter in here and you inject chemotherapy. This new concept is to place the catheter in the same place, but inject these micron size, 40 micron size radioactive particles. So here what we are doing is implanting a very hot radioactive source in the form of uh, 40 micron size microparticles. And we looked at this, one of our early series was in 2006, and we are a very busy transplant center. And so as we are developing new therapies, we wanted to make sure that we could validate and at least demonstrate the outcome of what these patients were uh, experiencing following our therapy. And I want to show you this one study that we did here because it challenges and really sort of shows one concept that challenges many of the things that we believe in radiology, which is the concept of arterial enhancement by contrast agents when we are performing imaging. So here we had 35 patients, a small study, and at the time when we closed the study, we had seven explanted livers because they were transplanted. So we wanted to take advantage of this, cut up the tumors, and see what we had. We have the imaging, we have the MRI scans, and we have the real tissue. So the MRI scan is the surrogate of what we think is going on, and the real tissue is what is actually happening. Interestingly, in this study, again, only seven explants, we were wrong five out of seven times. When we looked at our MRI scans and tried to predict what was viable or not, only two out of seven times was that accurate. And this is, this is sort of very, uh, uh, it challenges a lot of the things in radiology because to, di to this day, when we see enhancing tissue, we believe it is a viable tumor. Here's an example of a tumor that we treated, and on follow-up, you can see that it's all black, or most of it is black, which means it's non-enhancing. The contrast is not taken up in the tumor. The problem is it has this irregular enhancement here with mural nodularity, which by every radiologic textbook is tumor. So then we take the explant tissue and the pathologist cuts this tumor up at uh, millimeter slices and tells us this is not viable disease. There is no viable disease. And so this introduces the concept of not dead or viable tissue, but of dying tissue. And this is the difference. And so if we were to get a CT scan on this patient, Two days after we treated it, it can't all be dead after two days. It takes some time for radiation to take its effect. It now introduces the time-dependent concept 
of radiotherapies. And so what we did is to try to compare chemoembolization, which is what I told you is the standard of care, compared to this new therapy of radioembolization in a sort of a head-to-head -head manner at the pathologic tissue, at, at the pathologic level. It doesn't matter what you see on scans, but it matters what you see and what the pathologist sees uh, at, the, at the microscopic uh, level. And Ritu Nayar, our pathologist, looked at these uh, 35 patients for radioembolization and 35 for chemoembolization and found that 90% of all patients treated with this new radiotherapy had complete histologic necrosis when you had small tumors compared to one third. So here is a treatment, chemoembolization, the gold standard, shows a survival benefit, only able to achieve one third the complete path necrosis that this new therapy is able to. Again, when you get to larger tumors, that uh, message is there. And when you get to larger tumors, that message uh, becomes weaker, and both technologies certainly need to be improved. And so uh, we published our data uh, early last year on nearly 300 patients in gastroenterology, and it illustrated several things. You heard uh, Tim Cozell talk a little bit about quality of life, and what we've noticed, at least with this therapy, is that the quality of life is significantly improved compared to other embolics. These are therapies that are now done on an outpatient basis. No chemotherapy, no hospital admission, no pain meds, no steroids, none of these things that are usually associated with chemotherapies. A quarter of all of our patients were over 75 years of age. I mean, we have patients that are in their 90s that are well, that are doing well, that were able to get this treatment without significant uh, side effects. And again, here, 90% of our patients were, uh, had this therapy as a primary therapy. And I just wanted to show this slide, although it's very busy, really is a method of representing data that I believe parallels our clinical practice, which is we look at their child pew class, how uh, the me measure of their uh, liver function. We look to see if there's vascular invasion, and we look at tumor size. And this way, we can tell and prognosticate response and long-term outcomes by baseline stage, a very important thing uh, for patients. Now, I'm a radiologist, and again, I can't have a presentation without some dramatic images, and these are always sort of uh, uh, images that always generate a, a lot of interest. This is a patient I treated in 2006 with a 22-centimeter hepatoma. Path proven, this is Mary Mulcahy's patient. 22-centimeter path proven hepatoma with a few satellites. One month later, you see no difference in the outcome. And in fact, it looks like these lesions got a little bit larger. And in fact, this was before serafinib, where probably we would have included and given this patient a systemic therapy because probably we wanted to call him a progressor at this time. Problem is, none of these options were available, and so he gets follow-up. Three months later, he looks like this. He's had one treatment to the right lobe on one afternoon, no hospitalization. This is three months later. This is HCC. This is one year later. This is 16 months later. This is 22 months later with one treatment to the right lobe in a patient that untreated has a overall median survival of four to six months, depending on his liver function, but very, very dramatic effect. We had a four-year overall survival on this patient with a 22-centimeter hepatoma with multiple satellites. Here's another example, a 10-centimeter hepatoma in segment one, the center of the liver. And one of the concepts that's interesting with this therapy is bridging patients to cures. I told you earlier on that only 10 to 15% of patients are curative, resectable, or transplantable. But what if we can convert 20, 30% of these patients into the curative arm and then give them that long-term survival? Well, here's an example. This person is not a resection or a transplant candidate and has an alpha protein of 2200. Again, the concept is the same. At one month, you see no difference because radiotherapies take a little bit of time to manifest its, uh, to show their effect. One month later, the imaging scan is completely misleading in that it looks like complete viable disease. But the tumor marker, the AFP, is down by 95%. In this scenario, we follow the patient. We do nothing else. Three months later, his AFP is now normal. It looks completely necrotic. Six months later, from 10 centimeters to 4 centimeters, it's transplanted, cured out five years. So you took somebody that is in the 85% uh, incurable disease and now was transplanted after downstaging. So a lot of uh, things, uh, concepts that this new therapy challenges. Here's another case, 18 centimeter hepatoma that was resected to, re uh, that was downstaged to resection. So the surgeon saw this, said, I cannot resect this, I cannot cure this patient. He enters a palliative arm. We treat him, he's still in the palliative arm here. Surgeons see him, resect it, he's cured. Conversion from palliation to potential cure. So it really challenges a lot of interesting things. 
Imaging, what about imaging? Again, I showed you some very misleading things. We published, uh, I think, one of the seminal papers in JAMA last year on imaging and imaging concepts following local regional therapy. And we developed methods of assessing response here that you can see that no matter how we looked at it, the p-values were very, very significant with survival as the endpoint. So really essentially validating some of the concepts that we've been working on and a new uh, scoring system uh, for response because I just showed you many places where we are misled by imaging where we can potentially prognosticate complete pathologic necrosis. Since we are a busy transplant center, we have explant tissue. Let's look at the explanted tissue and correlate this with the imaging. What did we think we saw and what, did, uh, what uh, was actually present at explantation? And this is data that really shows that you can prognosticate complete pathologic necrosis. And if you include this new scoring system that we've devised, you can get up to almost uh, between 58 and 84 percent predicting complete pathologic tissue. Uh, because then this may mitigate transplant and resection in some patients. If somebody has a good liver function and you can absolutely say that there's no more viable disease in this liver, maybe this liver should go to someone else in terms of transplantation and this person can hold off. And so there are things that these findings challenge in terms of standard concepts. These radiation microspheres that, uh, that John Lick was talking about, in fact, uh, emit a very weak, what we call pair production. You guys all know about PET scans, FDG production. Well, it turns out that these yttrium microspheres uh, emit a very weak pair production, photons, that can, be, uh, that can be measured. And so this is a patient that had a hepatoma treated. You put them in the PET camera for 20 minutes. You don't inject them with anything. You don't give them any tracer. You just look and you can actually see these microspheres. This is a PET scan without the PET tracer. So very, very interesting. And now we can localize these microspheres and exactly predict this necrotic area here that we targeted this tissue properly or targeted this tumor properly. So here, confirmation that we targeted the right area. Quality of life, very important. This is a prospective study we just completed at Northwestern comparing this new therapy of radioembolization to chemoembolization. Uh, it's very hard, for those of you that haven't done quality of life studies or surveys, it's very hard to get patients to fill all these things out. And so uh, uh, we went through some of those struggles. But clearly we were able to show statistically that chemoembolization patients had worse side effects, loss of appetite and diarrhea, all statistically significant compared to this new therapy. So again, quality of life is an important factor when patients are deciding what sorts of treatments to undergo. To conclude here in over a few minutes, clinical trials that we are performing, there's some very interesting ones uh, that we are the lead centers on. Uh, the first one is called STOP HCC. It's an international randomized phase three trial with Y90, the radio embolization, compared to the standard of care serafinib. I'm the PI for that, 400 patients. That study has just been initiated. So now trying to add to the standard of care with, uh, with this new therapy, that's called STOP HCC. And the other interesting thing, and I was showing Dr. Kuzel this image right here, is one of the concepts in colon cancer is that when you progress on a certain agent, you're basically done with that agent, you move on to something else. Well, what we have been able to do with this new therapy is uh, recreate sensitivity to this prior agent. This is Folfox, an agent that is being used for colon cancer patients, and this person is progressing. This is the liver, and you can see all of these lesions. But after we give them this Y90, this radiotherapy, and restart Folfox, we now have this. So progression on a standard of care therapy that technically you're supposed to move on and receive something else. But if we intervene early enough, we can reverse uh, uh, the uh, uh, resistance to the agent, and now you have a response. Maybe now you can keep using that agent longer before you go on to the next agent. And as a result of these findings, that Mary Mulcahy and I are working on this trial that also has been initiated and is starting international randomized phase three trial called the EPOC trial, trying to add this radioembolization stuff to the standard of care chemotherapy in second line with progression-free survival as the endpoint. So really uh, interesting times setting the stage for now international collaborative randomized phase three trials. And as I said before, uh, on, a, on, the, on a collaborative basis, we work with uh, hepatology and medical oncology on a daily basis. In fact, this is where I have to run to at 2.30 is our multidisciplinary conference a little bit later on. But really has allowed us to, uh, to generate, I believe, these very uh, interesting uh, studies that should help answer uh, 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 clinical questions such as the role of liver-directed therapy in patients with uh, liver cancer. 
And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge we do have a lot of collaborators, including oncology and hepatology, and they are listed here. And with that, I can thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sale. That really, very inspiring. I really, it's really a, quite a case to see someone with this disease, disease-free for, for, for four years. That is immensely gratifying. And that's, that's sort of a bit, of a bit of what we see here in cancer therapy. We see some really high points of successes. And some of the questions are, how do we bring that to every patient? How do we, how do we overcome the heterogeneity among patients and within their treatment? How can we do that? Uh, but you can see the proof of concept, you know, that immunotherapy can work, localized radiation therapy can work, combined with surgery, you're gonna get people who will die in two or three months to live for years. So that's just a bit of summary here. Let's put it to the audience, yes. I understand that choosing the radio exobisos on your particular cells in the half right in the range of the uh, electrons, what other factors do you have to consider? So the yttrium has a half-life of about two and a half days which means after about 12 to 14 days, you've emitted about 95% of the radiation. And it's also a beta emitter. So the distance that it travels is about two and a half, three millimeters, although the majority of the energy is deposited within a millimeter or so. So what's very nice about a beta emitter is that even uh, in a, a well-encapsulated lesion, for example, even if you have uh, the colon touching it or if you have other organs, you do not have this attenuated radiation concept. And so everything is absorbed very locally. And so the shorter the attenuation distance, the more focal the radiation. And so uh, this is, this is there are other isotopes that people use, uh, P32, uh, holmium, lutetium. All of these things are all in the uh, same family of, of uh, radio embolics and internal radiotherapies. Uh, one of the weaknesses of yttrium has been imaging but it only took us 12 years to figure out if you just put a patient in a PET camera, you'll actually see something. <laughs> and this was just by complete chance. Uh, so you know, sometimes some of these are the most more interesting things are, are discovered by chance. So these are the things that have gone into it. The weakness people talk about is, uh, is the imaging. Uh, and I'm not sure that it might have been a weakness for 10 years, but I'm not sure that's uh, any longer a weakness. Yeah, so, so we don't make, these are commercially available products, and so there are manufacturers that make these, and so these are uh, FDA approved and commercially available. What we've been involved in is really sort of validating the clinical utility of these therapies. So clearly GMP is, is, uh, is something that is practiced. The dose in general that we talk about is 120 gray in one shot. Now the problem is the types of doses that we are giving with this therapy is much, much higher. This translates to 12,000 centigrade. Okay, this is gray, not centigrade. So we are giving extremely high focal doses of radiation with these microspheres. It is not the same language of radiotherapy that you're used to seeing, talking about uh, 30 centigrade, et cetera. This is 120 gray. And in fact, in some cases, up to 1,000 gray can be given to focal areas. And these become ablative doses. The other difference to other radiotherapies is this is a one-shot deal. You do one shot and you wait and you might retreat in three, four, six months. It is not one of these staged treatments where you do every day for, for six weeks, for example. So it's a completely different concept uh, in uh, brachytherapy. It's a low dose rate brachytherapy concept. So you implant it and you have about two weeks of activity. There's no, so it's a brachytherapy device. It's a beta emitter, which means there's no external uh, irradiation. There's no, uh, it is a device and a brachytherapy device that is not metabolized, so it is not a pharmaceutical, hence not excreted. Hence, no need for hospitalization and precautions. One, one question about gray. When you talk about gray, it's a radiation dose, but is there qualitative differences between beta radiation and gamma radiation? And yes. Or, or proton? Yes. Uh, what, what, you know, in general, when you're in the radiation therapy, how that accounted for in terms of biological effects and doses? So this is one of the weaknesses, right? The technical de definition is joules per kilogram, but the problem is that the mode with which this is delivered varies. And so, for example, if I'm speaking to a group of radiation oncologists and I mention I'm giving 120 gray, this is not the same thing. And, and to be frank, the, the, the definitions of gray were really developed by radiotherapy techniques. 
the people that developed these microspheres, the inventors of these microspheres, used formulae and adopted the unit of gray. My opinion is that this is probably not the best unit. We call it that, but it's probably not the same thing, because if we're really giving 120 gray to the liver in one shot, uh, this would melt the entire air, but that is not what happens. My feeling is this should be called gray with sort of a microsphere subscript of some sort, because it is not the same type of energy that is being deposited or, or released from, from uh, as that matter. But this is an area of debate, but the, 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 the formulae are devised, and the thing that sort of uh, uh, challenges us in terms of not uh, sort of making a difference to these units is that the dosimetry for this therapy is very simple, and we like simplicity. Uh, it works, and we sometimes challenge uh, you know, whether too simple is good, but in my opinion so far, the simple dosimetry model has helped quite a bit develop this therapy. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely know. So that very busy table that I showed you there has every rate of recurrence depending on your stage. Because as you can imagine, if you have a very small tumor, your rate of recurrence is going to be very long because I can ablate it or I can embolize it. But if you have a huge tumor, the success rate is going to be lower. So there's an inverse proportion between stage of disease and recurrence. So the other thing is, to answer your question, it is hard to compare RFA and Y90 because they're not used in the same patients. If I have a small lesion that I can ablate, we will use RFA and we will call it a day. That's what we will do. So we don't usually use Y90 in those lesions. So, so it's difficult to compare. But, but the RFA patients have early disease and they have about uh, 50 to 60% of five year survival. So they do quite well, but that's early. We get our patients when they have much more involved disease as I showed you, and so our median survivals are 22, 24 months, depending on the group that you're looking at. Dr. Cuzel. That striking HCC response. Yes. I'm thinking of an outlier. It, it is, uh, that's a very good question. Is this sort of my best case kind of deal? And uh, in reality, if I look at our chemoembolization, which is sort of a standard of care comparison, if you look at sort of the dramatic responses that you have with chemoembolization, our experience shows that there's about a 25% increase fold in dramatic outliers. This is where I think this interesting signal comes from, because you don't really see this with taste, but you see this in about 15% of patients. I have 30 slides like this I can show you. So that's our problem. So we are not at the same level as, say, colon cancer with, uh, with KRAS and Herbitux, et cetera. We can really identify who's going to respond. We do not have that. And so I don't know. That is our problem. And that's a problem with the whole field of HCC genomics is we don't have these, these predictive biomarkers where you have this, uh, we're going to give you this therapy. We have not reached sort of this individualized. We just have generic stagings, and these stagings, you get this therapy. But you know, some of these guys, even with that stage, they don't do very well. So we're, we're very far behind in the HCC world. I think, I think with the advent of this, there's a front page of the Times today, there's an article debunking gene biomarkers, which I think is a little bit of an overreaction by the Times. There was a study where people were trying to say, if you have these 10 genes expressed in this pattern, you should go on one therapy or another, and you might respond or not. And that turned out to be, uh, that study has got real fabrication problems. But there are. That's a problem. And I don't mean nanofabrication. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And, but there are clearly uh, patients with breast cancer, if they have a certain panel of genes uh, expressed or not expressed, those patients should or shouldn't, should or shouldn't get post-surgical adjuvant chemotherapy. So gene expression is one way to pick people out for therapy. What's gonna happen is, is, is whole genome or exome sequencing, sequencing every gene and knowing every mutation that's in every gene. And at some point, we'll be able to figure out you know, when it gets cheap enough, which is now about $3,000 per complete exome, meaning every expressed exome. That'll drop to a few hundred dollars. And then you may have, this patient had a liver biopsy. Right. You may have sequenced them say, we know this patient's got this mutation, that mutation, and those patients Should get are the to. patients that respond to, yeah. to the, the yeah. That's Agreed. something we can hope for in the next yeah. five years, I think. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.